Hey guys, Brian Stevens here with the National Real Estate Post. I got Dave Stevens, who was the president and CEO of the Mortgage Bankers Association, um, the past commissioner of the FHA, which is absolutely huge, and he's currently the CEO of Mountain Lake Consulting. Dave's done everything in the mortgage space and is always recognized as one of the most influential people in our space. So when Dave says something, frankly, we should all listen to it. We got a whole bunch of interesting things that are good. That's the truth, Dave. Come on, give me a break. It's the truth. Oh, you just don't take flattery well. Um, but hey, listen, it's really kind of, things are so strange today. Uh, yeah. I had a conversation with Barry yesterday. I said, all the traditional indicators that we look at, we can no longer rely on them because the, the world has changed so much. And I'm looking at some things on my end when it comes from a, um, a housing standpoint. And again, we're, we're getting into superlatives, areas that we haven't seen before. One thing really struck me, just give me a moment on this, but I was looking at some of the Hooverville encampments during the Great Depression in front of the White House. And I said, boy, these look like a lot of the encampments I'm seeing right now, multi-story, multi-unit encampments that are cropping up all across the country right now. The only difference is, is one is black and white and one is color in the clothes that we're wearing. But everything I'm seeing right now is starting to remind me of the, uh, the Great Depression. So here's what I wanna set up for you. Rents right now are up between 25 and 26%, depending on what the units are. According to Fred, the St. Louis Federal Reserve, the home price average is 525,000. The median is 433. Um, we have existing home sales, they've dropped 14%, which is also a problem, meaning that we don't have enough supply. And we know that housing starts, um, housing permits and housing completions are all down right now. And then I see Freddie Mac coming out talking about a down payment assistance program that they're going to a lender funded down payment assistance program. That seems so incredibly out of touch with any solution because anybody who would qualify for that down payment assistance simply couldn't buy a house in any metro area across the country. And yet our homeless numbers continue to rise. I also yeah. heard a hundred dollar increase in rents means 9% of renters can no longer afford their rents. These numbers are going to get worse. So, we look back over the past 93 years since we had those Hooverville encampments and we are back to square one. We're back at the starting blocks. So how can those who set policies and spend billions and billions of dollars over decades and decades look at anything as a success right now? Well, that's a mouthful, Brian. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but it is. And, and there's, and there's, um, there's, stories within each of those data points that you talked about. For example, the fact that home sales are down, um, uh, we're combining that with increases in inventory. In fact, inventory just shot up at one of the high, highest leaps uh, uh, month over month this last month. Um, and that's a good thing ultimately because it's going to level out this ridiculous home price appreciation that we've seen over the last two years, which has been, as we all know in this country, you know, double digit, in fact, near 20% um, from 20 to 21. And uh, and even Q1 21 to Q1 22, um, it, was, it was huge. But we've got a lot of variables happening. One is we've got uh, a huge demand just for housing units. And this sort of bleeds it, this into your theme about encampments. Um, and that's just pure demographics. Uh, we have zero employment. I mean, look at the jobs number that just came out. Uh, combined with this massive slug of millennials who are now truly employed and they don't want to live with their parents. They have jobs and they want their own places. And that's just, um, it's the biggest generation in history and the biggest cohorts of that generation uh, are, are, are now moving out on their own, either renting or owning. And, um, and we just aren't pre prepared for that as a nation. You know, you, there's a whole lot of uh, uh, fathers to this mess. Um, and the federal government, certainly one of them, we have a dysfunctional government that has a difficult time doing much of anything. Uh, no matter what you think about politics, uh, and let's put politics aside for a minute, there were a whole bunch of housing uh, bills that were gonna be proposed in this bill that just passed, this big, uh, uh, monolithic bill that the president uh, that just passed the Senate uh, and will pass the House shortly. That is um, uh, that that had billions of dollars to spend, but they cut out all the housing stuff. And a lot of it was monies to build affordable housing units. And you've heard 
uh, statements come out of the administration talking about uh, particularly HUD and Secretary Fudge's uh, comments about wanting to put more of a focus on uh, supporting manufactured housing. Um, but we have this real shortage of units. That's that's the that's that's all that's happening right now. And to your point, it doesn't really matter where you go. If you're looking to buy a home or rent a home, we just have massive price inflation and there's nothing we can do about that in the short run. Um, but the, the reality is that uh, what I'm gonna say next just infuriates people because you're gonna put a lot of people who can only rent and can't buy a home uh, in a position where they cannot afford rent. We already know that the poverty levels of renters is already extremely high when you inflate their rents. It just puts them out of the ability to afford rent at all. And in the short run, uh, in the absence of being able to build affordable, available housing units, you know, we as Americans only have a couple of choices. We can let them live on the street, uh, force families into homeless shelters. Maybe some can go live with their families, but that really is not a solution that's scalable for a whole lot of reasons about um, uh, family structure in this country, particularly with minorities uh, uh, and, and immigrants that have come into this country over the last decade. And so what do you do? And the answer likely has to be some form of subsidy while um, they, America tries to start amping up manufactured housing units to make them nicer and more available. You know, manufactured housing is not the 12 by 40 aluminum tin can put on a bunch of uh, cinder blocks that we know, at least I know from my upbringing. In fact, right. I lived in one for a period of time. Right. Um, but this is a global um, issue um, that is affecting housing. And, uh, you know, when the after World War II, as we all know, soldiers were returning to a similar challenge as part of all of the infrastructure that came out of the New Deal and more at post-World War II, America really invested in housing. Um, they helped subsidize the massive development of huge communities. Levittown in New York is a classic case of that. Uh, and that still exists today. It's a whole bunch of um, uh, small single family residences. They're all essentially identical and there are literally thousands of them stretched side by side. Um, now, there were problems with all of that because most of those were discriminatory. I mean, if you look up Levittown and Google yep. it, you'll see the famous uh, billboards that said blacks, no, no colored people or something of that nature. But nevertheless, America invested in housing. What we don't have today is any administration official who, is using how, who views housing as a crisis. Nor do we have any exactly. senator or member of Congress, but, but except a few, who view it the same way, um, Republican or Democrat. Find me a, a, a senator or member of the House who's, who's really complaining about housing and believes this has to be a priority. Um, I hate to say it because for you Californians, you may not always be a fan of hers, but Maxine Waters has been a real staunch advocate to get uh, a bunch of housing bills passed that would have created a fund for building affordable housing units, would have created a massive down payment assistance program, which would have get, given uh, a, a free federally provided down payment um, of a significant dollar amount for first time home buyers. Um, whether you like it or not, that kind of uh, activity needs to happen, but again, it, it gets almost eliminated by the other point you made in which um, just the price of housing, it was just reported that, you know, the median home sales price just reached an all time high a week ago um, yep. in, the, in the last report. You know, you can't, uh, you can't keep raising prices and interest rates, you know, they're mellowing out now, but they're leveling off, but you can't do what's happened over the last, uh, you know, four months and uh, in interest rates and then in in the last few years in home prices, not to mention the rental shortage, which is driving up rent rates and expect the down payment assistance is going to solve that problem. So we've got we've got a real problem in America. And I think for anybody who watches your uh, uh, broadcast, you know, your voice matters. I'm speaking. I'm, I'm keynoting a MBA conference here in a few weeks in New, uh, New England Mortgage Bankers in uh uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and then I just agreed to speak in Atlantic City at the Northeastern Mortgage Bankers Association shortly thereafter. 
that's a core theme, man. We got to, you know, why aren't state mortgage bankers associations um, uh, getting together and organizing and, and reaching out to their governors and their members of Congress and their delegation and saying, this is a really desperate problem. Why aren't state associations as well as the national MBA truly partnering with NAR and the home builders to make a big freaking deal about this issue? Why isn't this a glaring headline with all the cash that uh, our industry has about the need to advance affordability and build housing units? I don't hear governors speaking about it, members of Congress, and I think uh, trade associations are awkwardly silent on the subject. I email the head of the California Mortgage Bankers Association, Ohio, uh, uh, the New England Mortgage Bankers, um, I put them in my email list when I'm sending out examples of why this is a huge issue, but I still get crickets as a response. I don't ask them to do anything, but I think it's time we all started challenging leaders as to, you know, why aren't you even talking about this? We, we have nobody. Um, and we have a really diminished HUD secretary, whether it's Fudge or Carson before her, they have no authority. They're, they've already lost their the governance of Fannie and Freddie, which they used to once upon, once upon a time have. They used to have the regulatory authority that was all passed over to the CFPB. Uh, there was a time when the HUD secretary really did control housing policy. They don't anymore. Uh, they, they only control housing policy as it relates to the Ginnie Mae programs, uh, really. And even then it's very limited because a lot of what goes into Ginnie Mae are in two agencies that the HUD secretary has no authority over, VA and USDA. So we have this diminished little role for housing in this country when we're facing a massive problem. And for anybody who knows my history, going back to the MBA, I publicly called for uh, a key housing policy leader, some called it a housing czar in publications. I never used the word czar, but uh, that would be a direct report to the president whose job it would be to make this a priority and pull together an interagency effort to focus on housing. And this was back when I first joined the MBA back in 2012, 13, 14, 15. It's far worse now. And, and what the hell is going on? So, I mean, outside of our mortgage business, which is what most of you watching this care about and your day-to-day -day ability to do loan apps and what's happening in enforcement and discrimination and what's gonna happen with rates and all of this other stuff. The bigger issue that's facing our country in housing is just what you raised just now. You know, um... To your point, what you said, uh, this new bill that's being passed, anything that was housing related was scrapped from it. Yes. Um, we have defanged the head of HUD and we don't have a tip of the spear that's dealing with housing right now. The, Minia the Minneapolis Federal Reserve did a working paper saying that the National Association of Home Builders and NAR are colluding and it's almost a monopoly-esque approach to keep prices high on housing right now by not building enough units. The Minneapolis Fed, they just came out with this recently. And then what I've also heard is a lot of communities are, it's a, it's a working paper from the, from the Minneapolis Fed. It's I know, but I, I can assure you, no offense to who was, the, I don't know who the author was from the Minneapolis Fed, but um, you know, you get a lot of smart academics who write papers. I can assure you the home builders have no interest in colluding with the realtors. They actually are oftentimes on opposite uh, uh, sides on a whole lot of things. So, well, um, but anyway. well, let, well, let me ask you this and here's to my point is in a lot of communities right now permits are being given out to build you know large condo complexes to rent and it, at the expense of building single family residences for people to buy is this right. a is this a policy problem right now to where we're no longer giving people the ability to buy homes in communities in favor of i mean a subtle shift but in favor of building rental condo complexes allowing um, a, a shift from urban to suburban living that type of thing is this is this something that's trending? I think it's all a matter of public policy. And as we all know, particularly with sort of the federalism that's happening and has happened over the last several years where, you know, states' uh, rights are almost superseding federal law in many cases. Right. Um, states will have different personalities based on their leadership. But I will say this, as someone who's been in housing and actually worked at HUD for a secretary who believed in density housing near places of work uh, close to mass transit. So the idea was, if you really want to make housing affordable, uh, reduce windshield time, meaning don't force people uh, who have uh, median wage incomes to have to commute an hour and a half uh, from a remote community outside of an urban market where they work 
uh, because that's all they can afford. So the idea was uh, uh, sort of a, a, um, a progressive uh, view on housing is to support the building of high density uh, residential real estate, meaning tall, uh, high rise, where it's allowed, condos or apartments. Um, and as you know, in the mortgage business, you know, there's demand for both. Uh, multifamilies on fire. Um, it has a whole different funding source. Most of you guys don't even do multifamily. As you know, it's two separate businesses, but guys like Walker and Dunlop and others who are huge in that space finance these things. You can make those cash flow pretty easily. And we have high demand for both in terms of units and urban communities need workforce labor uh, as quickly as possible. So, you know, there's no perfect solution to these kinds of problems. You know, if I'm making a decision, do I put more of my public policy as a county leader or a mayor or a governor, whatever it would be, I'm focusing on building rental, affordable rental properties, as much rental as possible to, to keep my uh, businesses in my uh, core communities, being able to uh, continue to hire employment and employees and house their, their workers. I don't know, it's a, it's a tough trade-off, um, but it is very different in the single family space. And we all, as we all know in single family, and the reason why uh, we're seeing a real slowdown in home building is builders don't do spec anymore. And back in my day in the eighties, they built a ton of spec housing, okay. uh, meaning they buy a, build a ton of homes in a subdivision that were not pre-sold. And you could literally go in and pick out a model and it might be available for you in a couple of weeks. That was literally how the business worked until they got caught holding the bag in whatever recession it was. Um, so now they only do pre-sold and pre-sold demand slowed as rates began to rise. Uh, and so home builders have started slowing their building, not to mention the fact all this inflation is crushing. Um, they can't find employees, just like your favorite restaurant is having shorter hours or whatever it may be in the town where you live. That's the same with finding a labor pool to build homes. Um, and that's a whole longer discussion of why that's the case. But um, the net marginal return on building units right now is solely dependent on labor and having pre-sale demand. And both of those are absolutely going to slow when a Fed is determined to slow the economy down because housing is 30 percent of GDP. And the Federal Reserve clearly had housing in its target to try to get this to slow down because we were the most on fire, overinflated sector of the U.S. economy above and beyond anything else by leaps and bounds. Yeah. That's a mouthful, but that's where we're at. I, I went to one of those um, uh, commercial residential units that just cropped up from nowhere a few years ago out in yeah. Austin, Texas. It was one. It was super cool. I mean, when I'm an empty nester, I'd love to live in something like that. I want to. I want to move on. But my thing is, I've heard that we're three to five million units short of where we need to be in terms of housing to be healthy. So right. right now seems to me to be the opportunity to go out there and build some of this affordable housing, and it, it just stinks that it was scrapped from the bill. Uh, a question on non-QM right now. I just saw yeah. today um, Angel Oak, who's one of the biggest players uh, in the area. They're having a they're having a tough go at it right now. We all know yeah. what happened with Sprout. Uh, almost every non-QM company out there is hemorrhaging. Um, is Are they going to make it through this? And if they do, is it going to be your standalone non-QM companies or do you see that merging into a lot of your agency, a paper type of lenders out there? Yeah, I don't think agency players, uh, a paper players are going to get into non-QM in any significant way. Okay. I, I think, you know, maybe on the margin, large uh, whole loan portfolio borrowers who buy jumbo like Wells Fargo or uh, whoever that buy that's a jumbo investor they may come up with an easier qualification standard that's a little outside uh, a QM type loan in terms of documentation and more for high net worth borrowers and things of that sort. But that's not really where the non-QM market is going in the Angel Oak space. You know, what happened with these companies, Sprout, et cetera, uh, primarily was they got caught in the margin squeeze. Um, uh, they had um, provided advance locks to mortgage originators for their non-QM pipeline, rates spiked, um, and suddenly they had no buyers for that in, uh, for that level of investment grade product. And they were, they were caught really underwater in terms of their portfolios. And PIMCO obviously made the decision to bail out 
And then as we all know with Michael Strauss, uh, that's round two for him. Uh, right. He did the same and, uh, um, and no comment. But the, um, you know, I, those guys got caught in the squeeze and made a, an immediate reaction. We're just not going to take that kind of beating in a market that's already contracting and we don't know where rates are going. It, it's, it's a betting man's game. So uh, I can't risk, I, t I can't take the basis risk because the time it takes to aggregate and pool a bunch of non-QMs into a private label security and get that to market is entirely different than doing an ASAP delivery to an agency uh, on an agency product. So, and in that case, Freddie and Fannie take all the basis risk and they're not going out of business. So uh, the squeeze just crushed them. Yeah. Angel Oak, uh, Angel Oak's ja ju uh, just re recently released earnings reflected that squeeze, yeah. uh, but they obviously weren't crushed. Uh, they've been over the last, uh, since they've uh, become sort of a player in that space, they've been in and out a little bit on, on the non-QM world. But I don't believe this, I think if they were gonna get uh, killed and leave the space, it would have already happened. That spike that occurred when we went from three to six for a moment in time, now we're back around five or whatever, but that space was just um, so adverse. It, it crushed uh, the entire financial balance sheets of the two companies that went out of business. Um, Angel Oaks earnings sort of reflect that as well. Um, my sense is that they'll make this through and based on a forecast that I just recently got yesterday from um, a couple from two economists, one of which is Mike Fratt and Tony at the NBA, really uh, all believe that the spike we saw in 30 year fixed rate mortgages is, is really uh, over. And in yeah. many cases, yeah. Fratt and Tony believes rates are going to come sub five into the mid to high fours over the next two years. So we're actually going to moderate and stay there. And that volatility we saw based on all of this, what the, what's the Fed going to do and what's going to happen with the Fed's holdings of MBS and all of this emotional reaction that spiked rates through the roof so quickly was a phenomenon that uh, was technical and not fundamental. And the fundamentals are probably going to lay us in kind of where we are without big uh, adjustments in any significant way on an intraday basis or over the next you know couple of years as we look forward. So that makes that a much safer market for a non-QM player to participate. So while two went down, I believe others will come back in um, because there is demand for that kind of product and there's yield. Uh, and there's yield if, if rates are more predictable. I just think we need a little time here to believe in the predictability that these economists are telling us is, is going to be with us, if that makes sense. It does. And I, I just want to point out that I, I wasn't singling out Angel Oak uh, to anybody. I no, just, I know. I know. I just saw the same report and uh, they're top of mind right now. But uh, Essentially, yeah. every single non-QM company that I've seen has, has has suffered a little bit in this whole the whole thing. Well, and for originators, it's hard because you guys there were so many locked pipelines that blew up. And it, yeah. I mean, that's a that's a tough place to be. So. Yeah, especially if you locked with Sprout. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, the now I saw this um a number of months ago where the CFPB came out with a press release, and they were basically reaffirming their support for. Uh, state enforcement. I thought, boy, I don't really understand this. It just seemed, uh, it didn't seem like there was any meat on the bone. And then um, I just saw uh, the CFPB is going cracking down on data protectors, or it, excuse me, protecting individuals' data right now. Yeah. Uh, I guess my question is kind of twofold. When they came out with that press release, it almost felt like they were deputizing the states, like the CFPB doesn't have enough people to deal with the enforcement that they want. And so by extension, they're going to be using the states. Um, the data protection is interesting to me because uh, post-COVID, pre-COVID, remember the CFPB used to go into mortgage companies and actually walk around to make sure everybody's information was like locked behind, you know, locking key in, in uh, filing cabinets and that sort of thing. After COVID, all the, you couldn't control it anymore. All the workers, they, all the loan officers, they took off. So there was really no way to really monitor what people were doing or using somebody's, uh, a client's data. So is this data protection, the data protection issue that we're dealing with with CFPB right now, is it going to be a big issue for the second half of 2022? And is it a concern because we have so many remote workers right now, we don't know what laptops are open or where people are at and what exposure we have towards our clients' uh, information? You know, Chopra is um, very progressive. Uh, 
uh, he's Rich Cordray on steroids, in my view. Um, oh. And he, he, um, you know, he, he wants people in those kinds of public roles that are, you know, nominated and confirmed by the Senate and put in these very public roles. They're very eager to make a splash, to, to make a legacy for themselves. And uh, Tropa isn't shy about press. He, uh, he likes to state things and he's not shy on social media. All of you should be following him on Twitter um, because he's been making very public statements that uh, would lead you to believe that they want non-banks to have to have a CRA-like requirement and more. I mean, it's just really interesting to look. But specifically to your uh, to this point on data, look what's happened in the last few months. We have Equifax, yeah. the Equifax screw up, um, which I think comes under the fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me theory, but right. nevertheless, um, nothing really happens to these guys, but um, big, big mistake on consumer data uh, and information that we don't know what the what the shoe to drop there is, and if there's going to be a bunch of lenders holding reps and warrants on loans that they funded using FICOs that were not accurate, and how that's all going to come down. Very crazy stuff. We have, we have the most significant merger in the technology space in our industry's history. That's going to create in essence a vertical monopoly in technology if it ultimately gets completed and that's the ice uh black knight merger that's in play and that gives a lot of uh risk around proprietary data you know if equifax is huge in terms of data ownership this one's going to be huge in, in terms of data ownership and i know for a fact at least one of the gse's top leadership is very concerned about a private company holding that much data and then you got the Trident case, you know, Trident just settled this fair lending, I guess settled is the word, um, uh, paid a huge penalty in a fair lending case that the Bureau uh, came down on them for. And in that case, the number one item was uh, loan officer emails that were clearly discriminatory in the text of the emails. And, um, and so what that tells you is it doesn't matter whether you're working remote uh, or in the office, server data can be subpoenaed through a CID from the Bureau when they're involved in an, in an investigation and they believe wrongdoings involved. And so a violation is involved of fair lending. And so in that case, that was the no number one item named in the Trident case was um, Trident employees were sharing racist and insensitive emails about people and neighborhoods. And, you know, pretty alarming stuff. I emailed you about this, actually. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. And, 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 uh, and that was only one of the three find, major findings. But, you know, if you're the Bureau, yeah, do I have enough people to be checking all of this? No, but I do know that states license independent mortgage bankers and brokerage firms, and they go through an annual review uh, of these lenders to ensure that they're um, compliant. And so I do believe that was, I wouldn't call it deputizing, but there's no doubt that uh, Chopra saying this publicly will probably embolden a lot of states, state attorneys general, state banking commissioners to say, oh yeah, let's go after this and let's start taking a closer look, uh, put out directives to their examination teams so that they went, when they're in their uh, uh, mortgage banking offices, for the annual licensing reviews or biannual in a few states but if when they're going through those reviews that they're looking at data protection uh and things of that sort so look it's a it's a it's a brave new world and we don't have the foreclosure crisis it's not 2008 2009 with all these repurchases and rep and warrant risk and false claims act uh cases coming out of hud but we are all around fair lending and data protection. And those are uh, two variables that if you're running a company today, if you don't have this as a absolute top priority on your regular meetings with your leadership team, um, and you don't feel an ownership to those two variables, you are definitely at risk. And uh, a fair lending enforcement action no longer has to come from the bureau, it can come from the state and likewise, um, you know, any form of data violation uh, can can do the same. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a big deal. And I think 
this is where we need to be thinking about where regulatory risk is for all of us as we look over the next few years, forget what happened in, in the Great Recession and all that stuff, all the rules the Bureau put in place. Those are done, they're implemented, we're following those. We've got all sorts of new UDAP risk um, based on unknown variables because maybe some of us haven't policed our own companies to the level we need to. And I think that was Trident's problem. I don't, I don't think Trident actually was doing enough oversight with a good law firm or compliance firm, helping them make sure that they weren't doing things or put another way, making sure they, they weren't making sure that they sh were doing all the things they should be doing uh, to be fully proactively compliant with fair lending variables. So. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. <laughs> if if they started subpoenaing uh, private email accounts from loan officers from any company, I, I, I can promise you this, the outcome would be absolutely horrifying. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. Dave, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You bet.